now on four, Cutting Edge enters into the closed community of northeast London's orthodox Hasidic Jews. o'clock now Saturday night and one of the problems is at this time a lot of the men are coming away from synagogue. Uh, the pubs are closing so the punters are coming up looking for the girls. This particular community is extremely isolated from the rest of the world. Very few of them read newspapers. Very strictly moralistic a very close community and I thought I knew about Jews until I saw Stanford Hill All your kids, all your luggage, you can fill it up, take it home. Not marvellous on the body, but cheap. Cheap. So why is it that so many people in Staffordshire drive Volvos? Uh, good question. I suppose years ago, everybody drove big Rover three litres. It's just a big car, a strong car, family car. Traditional shape, reliable, that's about it. Most of them drive all those states, which really there isn't much else you can get to compare. We're actually in Stanford Hill now, although the Orthodox Hasidic Jewish community actually call the whole area Stanford Hill. It's only in fact one road. And we're coming up to the junctions East Bank, West Bank, one time regarded as the centre of the prostitution. And also, I think the lar largest yeshiva, Jewish school in the area. This one's called Yesode Hatara if I pronounce that right, but it's known colloquial by a lot of the locals as yesterday and tomorrow. We're actually in Dunsmuir Road now. We're heading down to a couple of parades of shops that actually service the local community. Getters International PLC UK Regional Sales Division, good afternoon. Oh God, yeah, mate. Talk. I've, always, I've always been frightened of cameras ever since I was a kid. I'm serious. When I was a kid, I suffered from Polaroids. I was a late developer. I'm serious. <laughs> don't be so negative about that. It was quick as a flash anyway. I don't know whether I come in this shop for food or for, for, a, for a cheerful repartee. <laughs> that man's back of his head's been filmed on every television crew. Look at his face. <laughs> Having a television is the spiritual equivalent of having a sewer through your living room and whatever the trendy left-wing loony liberals with a small l say about this does not have an effect on children this does not have an effect on adults the bible does not say that the bible says that what you see with your eyes and you listen to with your ears will affect your heart Well, it's, uh, what, I'm, what I've told people, you're doing an Equal Opportunities, um, you're doing an Equal Opportunities video for Hackney Council. Why did you tell them that? Well, I didn't think of it, the, when the, somebody asked me, I couldn't, I couldn't think fast enough. 
What would they think if you were, if you were doing television? There's all this, there's, this is what you call in this community, you've got balances, checks and balances. I can afford it. And television can be corrupted. Now you're going to say, you've got a television, there's a lot of good things on television. I don't believe if I would have a television at home, that I'd actually turn it off when I should turn it off or just turn it on when I should turn it on. I'm human. Are you filming all of this? A bit of it. <laughs> you know, like, it was all off the record, it was all off the record. I brought myself, I got my schmatter couple, I bought myself a new couple, I didn't put it on. Can we go all again to Mrs. Um, to Mrs. Mrs. Lumber? Start the day again. Yeah, sorry. See you later. I've got my schmatter. Is that your best one? Um, this, best is, this is no. This is the one which I, this is my sleeping couple, and which my wife, whenever I come home, she starts shouting at me, and she always says, and she puts it in my pocket. I shouldn't forget it, and I always do forget it. But I, before I go home, I put it on. So how many do you have? I've got one, one for sleeping, and one which I, um, which I wear when I'm out. Okay, let's. Um, the, um, this school was founded in 1942 by a group of Jews who came from Nazi, um, who came just before the war and they, they, to escape Nazi persecution. So they came here as displaced refugees. So the first thing that they they actually tried to protect was their culture. And to protect their culture is one thing which is very central in Judaism is education. Okay, let, let me start writing the names down. Oh, Sam. <laughs> let me tear them off, okay? Yeah. You have to think some idea what we can do. Okay, the, the, you, you're senior. I've taken your name down, okay? Me? Yeah, yeah. You weren't standing here? No, I just. Came okay, alright, alright. So, 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 the other one. How long that lasts? We will. Why are the boys and girls educated separately? Well, the, we have in, in the community has um, different moral values than those accepted in the wider community. And um, therefore, part of that, those moral values, is, it calls for the separation of girls and boys. It has nothing to do with the way the children are educated. In fact, it has long been recognised that the girls do get a, a, a much stronger academic education than the girls. It's a contradiction in terms. Oh, yeah, it's a, no, I'm sorry, but that's a contradiction in terms. I'm not good at this, so what do you want from me? your Liberal Democratic Council candidate. Oh, sorry. Liberal politics. No, no, no. Um, mm. I'm sorry, dear. Um, we are Labour. You're Labour? I'm sorry about that. So give my love to Paddy Ashton. I will. Okay, then. Bye. Bye. Give my love to Paddy Ashton. And I've sent in my claim forms. There's no record of my claim forms. August, they yeah. found them. <laughs> Apologised. Uh -huh. and promptly lost them again. Uh -huh. And the bailiffs kept on calling all the time until February. And we'll check your account and your wife's account. We'll see how much and money Yossi, is... And, and Yossi's, don't forget, Yossi has to son. stay at home. My son has to stay at home and look after us. Right. And, so you've and got they, three they've adults. known that ever, since that ever since he's left school. Yeah. I hope you'll do something uh, about our area a little bit better than it is. Our, my, the, the, my car is rumbling, banging on all the, the holes in the roads. I yeah. hope you'll do something about that. Since the snow, it's got even worse. 
really yeah. something has to be done and about has, it. Has anybody been around at all to have a look at no, it? Nobody as far as I know. Our road here is fine, but the main Kyverdale that everybody uses mm. is, is absolutely ridiculous. The, the suspension on our cars gets ruined day by day. Oh. really is something terrible. man to do this kind of job? Do anything as long as you earn an honest living. Doesn't matter what you do. Well, let go of it. You do any type of jobs. What do the other people in your family do? The other people? Uh, rabbis. That is about it, really. Is it many facets that you deal with? Not really, no. no. All different types of people. before anything you eat. You eat anything at all, even a sweet or a grape or a piece of fruit, you have a blessing before you eat. For a blessing after you eat, thank you, um, there's a minimum quantity, which is the size of an olive, a Talmudic olive, which is bigger than a, a, a modern-day olive. So this obviously fulfills the requirement of, a, of what's called benching in Yiddish, or saying a blessing after eating a meal containing bread. Are you going to win? Well, the campaign? If the Almighty and the people of Hackney want me to win, I shall win. I was very mainstream as a child and as a teenager and younger man went out completely assimilated into white gentile English society and uh, came to the end of the road when I was 29 when I decided that Western civilization really wasn't getting anywhere. I was a marketing and public relations manager for Massey Ferguson. And I was very lucky because my mother sent me to Israel for a holiday. And while I was in Israel, I met a very well-known rabbi who uh, literally saved my soul. And I've been an Orthodox Jew ever since. Do men usually wash up in a Hasidic household? Well, in this Hasidic household, as there's only a single man living here, he tends to wash up about 100% of the time. But in uh, families, obviously, the woman is in charge of the house. I've got two sinks. This is the meat. I've got another sink over here that's blue. I keep it for milk. It's a good idea as well for, to have colours for children because they do help. A six-year-old helps. So she knows the colours and she knows where everything goes. So all this I keep it milky and all this I keep it meaty. And it's the same thing for dishes, pots and pans, of course. And uh, some people who can afford it, so of course they've got two kitchens. 
a meaty one and a milky one. Even some of them have a Passover one and uh, two fridges if they can. But I mean, I really can't. I mean, some people can't afford it. I can't afford it, so I just manage the way I, I do. I mean, if you can't afford it, just one thing will do it. You just keep a drainer, different drainers, and a different cloth for the milk and a different cloth for the feet, for the meat. <coughs> I did look on the outside. I think nobody else do. But uh, I find it done much more happier the way I am. I mean, first of all, you can't have a career and have so many children. If you do, I mean, you have to be strong. But uh, I'm happy at home with my children. I socialize, I go out. I do work sometime. I help in school for teachers when, they meet, you know, when they're not well. I mean, I'm happy. unusual to find a, a woman with perhaps 15 children also having a job being you know, a very responsible job such as a headmistress of a school um, and in, in quite a number of the families the women do have perhaps some part-time work or work that they just do at home I think in many cases when women may be depressed let's give for an example postnatal depression they probably wouldn't be forthcoming in um, wanting anybody to know about it and I think that they probably would hide it um, because they don't want the rest of the, their society to know that they're not coping or not seem to be coping. Uh, so I, I would imagine that there's probably a lot of undiagnosed cases of depression than, than we actually do know about. But it's very rare for a woman to actually um, talk about uh, difficulties in coping uh, mentally. designed to be fertile from a quite a young age and they're also given the med the mental and emotional equipment to be mothers in their 20s and uh, that is the optimum time for people to start having children now if you're going to say that you're going to educate girls until they're 21 22 23 and then they've got to get a job and then they've got to work for two or three years afterwards you're actually bypassing the safest and healthiest time for them to, to start having babies. We call Mine Peronios, Hamis Rakshais, Uvais Lailam. The Sushlach Baracha, the Hamasa Yodeno, the Sitneno, the Heino, the Chesed, or the Rachamim, the Enecho, the Ene Kora Enu. The Sushma Koil Tachon, the Enu, Ki El Shamea to fill up the Sachon on Ata. Boroch Ata, I don't know, Shamea to fill up. Oh! 
The Orthodox and Hasidic community are a very close-knit community. They have what is known as Kahila, which simply means community. And it is an organisation which they've built up and they are a very close community. In fact, they're most probably closer to their relatives and, and contacts in places like New York and Jerusalem and other centres of, of orthodoxy throughout Europe than they are with the rest of the community around them. And I think when there, is, there are problems within that community, it very often doesn't come outside. Very often the overriding factor of a lot of things that are done within the community is that it must remain a community issue rather than coming out and bringing shame on the community by being brought into the outside world. And in fact, one of their most serious offences, as they see it, is to actually inform or bring an issue to the outside. They feel that most issues should be dealt with um, by rabbinical courts rather than bringing the matters to the outside or washing their dirty linen in public. Whenever you're dealing with this particular community, you sometimes have to rearrange your pattern of thought. All of us live on the edge of forever. With traditional Western thought, I think you can say the forever is forward. We're looking forward uh, and looking for where we're going. My humble interpretation is that this particular community are on the edge of forever, but their forever is back, is behind them. They're very much tied to history and tradition and what's gone before. And it is almost as if the future is irrelevant, apart from, you know, the coming, the messianic legend, you know, to them the messianic fact that, the fact that the Messiah will come. And that seems to be the only important thing in their future, anything more than the immediate future. And it, it gives them, to my mind, a slightly different slant on things than what perhaps you or I would, would, would see as important. I mean, the whole philosophy of the area in which they live is not really important to them, or, or it doesn't seem that way. As long as they are within the community, what else is in the community, or what supports that community, is what they have to have, but it's not really important. Um, and I often think they regard the police force and other services as the way most other people regard the bin men. We're just another service. Hello. Morning. Good morning. Uh, Good morning. Abraham Pinter. Good morning. 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 Hello, back, take a seat, everybody. Wherever you can find <laughs> Whatever, make yourself comfortable. Okay. Well, welcome. Um, I've actually been asked to give you a talk about the Orthodox Jewish community. Um, you probably have met, some, met many of them, and you've probably formed some ideas of your own. We wear unusual clothes, we've got large families, and um, we're, we're generally found as pro please. Is that right? Well, no, I hope so. <laughs> um, now, what I'd like you to do, I'd like if any of you have got any questions to ask. Okay. Just one question. How do you feel about the uh, current problem of the prostitution? Uh, in, uh, as you know, I wear many hats. One, two. One of them... I'm the chair of the MS Park Action Group, which is very much involved. We take it very seriously. As a community, we, we take it seriously, and everybody takes it seriously in the air. It's a problem for, for all communities, particularly those with strong family values. And we would like to see the problem solved. The elder members of the community are very frightened for their young men, you know, seeing it going on around them. And particularly where we've had uh, complaints around one of the yeshivas, I, I think that's half to do with it, that they don't like the idea of the young men exposed. I mean, you must realise, they must realise what's going on. I got banned from Lordship Park last year because one came out and told me to move and I said I wasn't moving, this was my country and he had no right to tell me what to do in my own country. 
and he turned around and he said if I didn't move he was going to bring 50 people out in their cars and stop my business. So I went to walk off down the roads and he tried to run me over. He still threatened me so I said you go and get your 50 yids and I will go and get 50 karate people and 50 kempu because I do karate. And then there was one I picked up, I got in his car and like, when he was driving, like, he goes, what sort of business did you mean? And like, when I told him, he goes, um, if I catch you out here again, I'm going to stick a stick of dynamite at you and blow you away. And she said, that'll cost you extra. Yeah. <laughs> Robson, Denise Marianne, 823. Wise, Zalkin Diakov, 426. And I declare that the said Denise Marianne Robson has been duly elected to serve as a councillor for Northfield Ward. <laughs> Yeah, I think Labour won by 11 votes. Look at the service. Yeah. All right. What's going to happen now? We're going to live to fight another day. We go onwards and upwards, marching to the beat of Paddy's drum. Do, do you think um, someone up there is trying to say something to you? Yes, I think somebody up there is trying to say that there are better things in life than being a member of Hackney Council. I think I probably agree with them on the quiet. So you know, who's um, who's a considerate driver? I didn't, um, I wouldn't accept that the, that the community drives worse than anything. That's normal London driving. And community drive, they don't drive better or worse than anybody else. I wouldn't say it's one of the community's plus points. Hello? Yes, Mick. Very, very quickly, tell me what this car's worth. I tried to get you a minute ago. 89 on a G Scorpio. Done uh, 48,000 with history. Black with leather. What's that worth? Booked at 10,850. Yep. I know it's done a bit of leg, but I think on a G it's... If you put 9995. Yeah. Do you want, do you want, want a picture, a nice picture of a broken window over there? <laughs> this car was parked down there and somebody came in, smashed it together with another car. No, there is. No, there is. Oh, there was or there is? There must have been this too. The radio's still there. I'm leaving back tonight. Yeah. You have a lot of trouble with vandalism. Around this area, there's plenty of it. Turn on better parts. Did you get the police? Waste of time. Seven two one nine. Councillor, I'm on the other phone. Can I call you back? You've sent me your phone number. I'll speak to you in a minute. Okay, bye. Neville, Steve Longhorn at Stone Newington. Um, Councillor Abraham Lewis just sent me a fax. <laughs> one of his um, community has received something in the post, which is a poster and a letter entitled Holler Hoax and it's on the right hand side there's a picture of a lavatory with a star of David on it uh, an arm coming out of the lavatory pulling a chain with six million tattooed on the arm have you seen it before? Shall I just read it through for you so you know what I'm talking about it's headed Holler Hoax the six million lie flushed down the tubes 
Why not six million and one? Surely one more is not overdone. A little more gas, one more squeezed in that mass, one more year gets a place in the sun. And it said this poem is directed, sorry, dedicated with profound respect to the Right Honourable Greville Janner, QC MP, WC and Chain. Uh, it goes on a little bit more of the same. Courtesy of the newly formed White Revolutionary Resistance Army British Wing, hail to the Sohim or Sonim, underlined death to all Zionist, Marxist, communist and super capitalist Yiddish swine. From conversations I've had with Holocaust survivors, they have this need to recreate their families. They, 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 they are a link in the chain going all the way back to Moses and to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and they don't want to see the chain end with them and the chain was snapped and by a very thin thread the chain survived and they want to rebuild that chain to the strength that it was before the war and that takes a lot of input, a lot of energy, a lot of education, a lot of transmission from one generation to the next of culture and of history and they are very concerned that is their raison d'etre that is the thing that's keeping them alive the fact that they can transmit their lifestyle to their children and to their grandchildren and it means that hitler did not win because if jews stop being jews today 50 years after the war hitler will have won it's not right for man to be alone. That's why Eve was created for Adam, and that's why Adam wouldn't be where he was without Eve, and Eve couldn't survive without Adam. That's what the whole idea of a shidduch is, and, and also of, of arranged marriages. It's bringing two people together and strengthening the Jewish people by bringing new life into the Jewish people. I mean, if a romantic love was the, was the best way, how come so many, are there so many divorces that are started off on this romantic love? How often do you see wherever they're together and it's lovely and it all flies out the window? You basically you have to have the same ideas about life. No one says you can't have the romantic love. You definitely have to like someone. You can't just go on a shidduch and just because it's a shidduch get married and finish. Definitely have to like them. So, and then it works. The great big love comes after of the years of your putting in, your giving to each other, that's when the love comes in. That's what I think, anyway. Yes, the thing is that you shouldn't be really seen too often together because uh, people are going to start asking you, are you engaged, and so on. So you should really go somewhere where maybe, you know, uh, it's a little bit discreet until such time that you are engaged. Yeah. Well, I, I wouldn't let the, this shidduch carry on for more than more, three weeks. You see, you know, he's not exactly a young man, and I do feel that he wants to get to know you a little bit better. It is a commitment for life, and uh, he just wants to, you know, uh, to get the relationship, um, you know, a bit more cemented. Yes, well, the thing is that uh, if we get a feedback and we feel that the relationship is going a step nearer to the engagement, then we're quite happy with it. And if we feel at any stage that, um, you know, uh, something is wrong, then we'll come back to you immediately so that you're aware of it. You, you mustn't put him under any pressure, really, yes, because the, if the pressure it has got to come from us, we will be the ones who will be saying, well, no, you know, you've got to take a decision now, you've seen her, and, um, you know, yes, you shouldn't, be, you shouldn't put at all any pressure on him. Um, it was a couple in Golders Green who suggested him for me, and um, we went through rigorous... Um, going into all the details, who he was, how old, what did he do, all the things that, to find out exactly what he's all about. And since he's from abroad, so it was, you know, you have to ask around people who he knows from England. And um, then my parents went through it all and they discovered that it wasn't such a bad idea anyway and it might be a very suitable match. So he flew over and they asked him if he, would be, if he was interested in me. It's all right me saying I'm interested in him. So, um, and he was, so we met. And then two weeks later, we were engaged. Met, it, we didn't, yeah, that's right. I've been wearing a wig for about 34 years since I'm married. And uh, now the wigs are very beautiful and it's much easier to wear them. Whereas the beginning, 34 years ago, it wasn't so nice and it wasn't so easy to get used to them.
I, I had a lot of headaches. So obviously, I had uh, this headache because I had something quite heavy on. And uh, but slowly, I got used to it. We had to wear it, so there was. But now the great improvement is is that they look so much more natural. Well, from the time they get married, uh, it's a law to cover one's own hair, not to show any hair at all. It's, um, it's a sign of modesty to cover one's own hair. They, they, the husband wishes, and I think that every young married girl likes to please their husband, and um, so I don't think there's a question of um, rebelling, because um, they've been brought up that way, that uh, when they get married, they're going to um, wear a wig and cover their hair. Twenty percent of my clients have got no hair, they are shaven. Uh, Fifty percent have medium length hair and fifty percent have quite long hair. Our brides vary between seventeen and twenty, really, that's the ages of the youngsters getting married, really. You want to basically know that you can have somebody who will build a faithful and true house in Israel. That's right. Somebody who I know would be a good father to children, a good companion, somebody I could rely on, keen on. I need somebody who, who was basically a lot cleverer than me so I can have somebody that I can rely on for decisions rather than I feel I have to take them on for myself. So that's what I got. Uh, and I'm very happy. <laughs> <laughs> and anything else that she's having? Nothing else besides breast milk at the moment. Contraception is something which is generally not used among the uh, Hasidic community. The Hasidic women do have to abide by uh, certain purity laws. Um, of course, this, is, this just relates to married women. During part of their cycle, they're considered to be unclean. And this is during the time of their period and for seven days after their period. During this time, uh, sexual relationships are forbidden. Um, after they've had the seven clean days, they go to visit a mikvah, which is a special bath, um, where these women have to go and they totally submerse themselves in the bath and say a prayer. And at the end of this, they are then considered to be clean again. It's usually at the mid-cycle, which is often the time when ovulation takes place in, in most women. And sex is not just for procreation, um, but there is a commandment um, which commands the husband that he, you know, he should actually be able to satisfy his wife's sexual needs so that it is for pleasure apart from just pro procreation and this is quite an important part of their marriages. Hello. Yes, in the yard. Why? I'm just standing now in the yard. I'm just standing in the yard. I mean, don't you want something that's like a proper and ex company and a low mileage with the service history? Um, I've got a little Rover 216, but that's done uh, 70,000 now. Yeah, 8,700 deep. 
that you get there for 22 and a half, but it's got a crack in the windscreen and a crack in the headlight. Uh, it did actually have, but it's somebody lent it in the can. That's one of the synagogues here, so you wouldn't, you wouldn't particularly think so. Lots of them around, but you get to know where they are. Good afternoon, sir. How many children do you have? Do you know? Uh, obviously not, because you've got to count them. Yes. When did you start your journey, sir? From school. And where's that, sir? That's in there. Uh, Which road? Lampard Right. How many children did you have then? You don't know? No. Something like that. Right, OK. And it's this, this thing, what we do now. Right. You really are going to have to get a grip of the situation, gentlemen. Can you hear me, sir, at the back? Yeah? He doesn't speak English. Right, OK. But you'll tell him what I'm saying, will you? Right. Some time ago, myself and some colleagues from the traffic police had conversations with the gentlemen who drive the school buses about their responsibilities in relation to the number of children they have on board. And we made it very, very clear about how many children you must and you mustn't have. All right? Now, the very fact that when I ask you how many children you had on board when you started the journey, and you can't tell me, demonstrates to me that you really have got no idea what you're doing in relation to what we told you several months ago. Doesn't it? Would you agree? Right. I don't want to have to keep coming round here day after day and stopping you and your colleagues for having too many children. But it's nice to see that you've got the second gentleman on board, second person on board. What's more, it's nice to see that you had the door locked so that the children couldn't open the door and get out. But they shouldn't have been in the front, sir, should they? Yeah, no, they're, they're the maids, because they just pick them up. Yeah. yeah, I know. There's always an excuse. I've it's always got an excuse as well. Yeah. 
Jewish population in the world today is still about 12 million, the same as it was in 1945, because non-Orthodox, non-observant Jews have less than two children on average, so they're not even replacing um, the current generation. And the small number of Orthodox families who have more than, on average, have about six or seven children, so they have a, it sounds a lot, and they have more than the average British or Western um, family size, are still going to make no uh, dent in the, in the post, what I call the post-war holocaust of the Jews, which is the Jewish people decimating itself by not being fertile enough and not, not reproducing. And uh, this is the fault of the women's movement and other, and socialism and other political uh, movements that have grown up since the war that have discouraged men and women from wanting to have children and wanting to have pleasure. Yakov, if you believe that so strongly, why haven't you got any children? I'm not answering that question. <laughs> but if, you, if it's your biblical duty to do it. I'm not, I haven't got any children because I'm not married. Would you like to be married? Of course I'd like to be married. Do you think you will be married? I'm sure I will be married, if I do the right thing. And what's the right thing? The right thing is to study... <laughs> ..is to study and to uh, improve myself and to meet... Uh, ..make sure I meet the right person to marry. He's gone over that way. She's been a happy pair for 120 years. Okay, nice. Since then, he sent a present after you, but you haven't got it, yeah? Don't worry, okay. don't worry. <laughs> Tonight's programme again this Friday at five o'clock.